the ML team has to take more chances. And you cannot have the ML team work on a schedule and have clear times for when something is done. Something might never be done. It's also okay to fail. If someone starts a project today at UiPath and there is no result, but they do the right thing and you, you learn from that, that's a good project. Sometimes you have to spend some time to learn that something doesn't work. You're listening to Gradient Descent, a show about machine learning in the real world. And I'm your host, Lucas Bewald. Today I'm talking with Mircea Nagovich, who is the VP of AI and Research at UiPath. UiPath is a company you might not have heard of, but they're a leader in the space of RPA, which is essentially a way of automating a lot of the tasks that companies do. So Mircea is an expert on real world machine learning, getting something working for tasks that actually matter to businesses. This is a very practical, very interesting interview. I thought a good place to start would be your current company, UiPath, because I think the applications there are things that a lot of our audience might not know is, a, is an issue for businesses. So I thought maybe you could describe what UiPath does and then get into how machine learning fits into that. Yeah, UiPath uh, is in the RPA business. This means robotic process automation. What it exactly means is basically programs that can do repetitive tasks that humans don't want to do, uh, simple tasks. Uh, it's been a good business for the company f- since about 2015 or so. But if you make those robots smarter and if you put machine learning into them, then I think we can take this company to a new level. So I think RPA has a lot of potential, but RPA plus AI has a lot more potential. I totally agree. Uh, But before we get into the AI, could you give a few examples of where RPA might affect someone in their day-to-day life? I think in all areas, you see people doing repetitive tasks, like opening an email, opening an attachment, uh, look at some data, copy a number into a form, then go back to that email, take another number, put it in the form. These kind of very simple things. But they take time and they can actually fail. Uh, Robots, once they get started, they are more reliable. Mm -hmm. And how do you actually set up uh, today like an RPA task? Like, is this a programmer does it or can anyone do it? We have a concept of RPA developer. Uh, RPA developer is our target for most of our products. An RPA developer is uh, not a software developer, is maybe more like a basic developer from 20 years ago. They understand data, they understand processes, they know what has to be automated, and then they create the workflows. There is a separate question about what do you want to automate, and I think we'll talk. We'll probably cover that a bit later when we talk about the project. Uh, it's not always clear what to automate, especially in a big company. But once you know what to automate, the RPA developer job is to take a process and make a workflow. Out. Got it. So UiPath has been one of those really phenomenally successful companies that a lot of people might not have heard of. Like what's the, what's the killer use case for UiPath that's, that's made it successful so far? I think it's the broad usage. I think, I don't know if we have a killer scenario, but we, we are able to save costs and we are able to have those repetitive processes taken care of by the robot, which allows people to do more of other things. I think we all had experiences when we have to do something that we don't exactly like to do, like move the data from one place to another, from Excel to a form, fill the form. This is, I think, the the, the power of of RPA, being able to do a lot of those processes. What do you think is the the current level of of use of ML in in UiPath today? like how, how much ML is actually working in the product right now as opposed to in the future? We have been starting putting ML into RPA about four years ago. Our first project was a computer vision project. Uh, our robots usually work because they know the Windows APIs and they know what's on the screen, where to click and where to type. But this is not always the case. If you run in a remote desktop, there is no Windows API available. You only see a picture. 
uh, if you are in an operating system other than Windows, the same thing. So for us, falling back on the picture and making our robots work with the picture, without the APIs, um, was, a, was our first project. And it is a competitive advantage for us, as far as I can tell. Our competitors don't have this uh, computer vision uh, feature. So what is it after the feature does it? It's like finds like the button to click on yes. based on the screen? It finds all the controls on the screen, mm-hmm. which are available to you if you are on Windows and we can actually uh, use the Windows APIs. But if we have the picture, we have we can find everything in the picture and then we have a design time and the runtime. At the design time, we detect all the controls and people can design their workflow. And then at the right time, we have a picture that's different, different resolution. Uh, it's not the exact same picture, but it looks the same. And then we find the controls and we know where to click on the type, given what we have done at the at design time. So you, you started with um, this this vision task, actually a really interesting task. And then what were kind of the follow-on tasks that you made work with ML at, at UiPath? Then the next thing we realized is that we have now the controls on the screen. And we want to do OCR. There are many cases when we want to do a, a, a screen OCR. And we were using at the time Google and others, uh, but we thought nobody really did optimize the OCR for the screens. Mm. And we thought we have an opportunity to, to do a better OCR for our use case. And then we implemented an OCR uh, around three years ago. Uh, it was not different than others do. I mean, it's still the same idea with the de- detection first. You find where the text is, and then you do recognition. We didn't invent a new OCR, but we did train on our own data and our own use case, and we built a significantly better OCR in the process. The same thing for documents OCR later. Uh, We don't have such a big advantage in performance, but we have more flexibility. We can put it on device, we can put it in services, we we, we we can ship it in any way we want. So OCR for screens and OCR for documents was another project. And then also during 2018-19, we were hearing from customers that they want to do document processing, emails, semi-structured content, unstructured. There is very many scenarios from, from very many customers we've seen. I think it was quite clearly that the number one thing in document processing is doing information extraction from semi-structured content, invoices, receipts, purchase orders. Um, And then we made some models that can actually can read those documents and extract what we really care about, uh, including, uh, like I said, receipts, invoices, purchase orders. And now we have like 15 or 18 document types, W2s, W9s, and so on. Uh, we do some classification for those documents. We have models that do information extraction from unstructured contact, like legal contracts, lease contracts. Uh, we put quite a lot of effort into document understanding. So you've, I mean, you have like a lot of custom models running um, in production. Like yes. how I, I feel like you know, compared to a lot of companies, you probably have a more advanced, you know, kind of operational setup than others. I'm kind of curious how it. What it what the structure looks like? We we had we made a decision in 2018 to make a framework for hosting those models. The interesting thing is that we don't only want to do hosting; we also want to allow customers to fine tune our models or to train our models. Mm-hmm. And then, at the time, we didn't see any. Part, anyone to partner with this. There were some solutions in the cloud, but nothing on-prem. A lot of our customers have more trouble to move from on-prem to cloud for our scenarios. Uh, people now accept that email and documents are okay in cloud, but when it comes to processes and invoices and stuff, there, there is more reluctance. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we put some a lot of time and effort into this. It's a big engineering project. Uh, this was not an ML project, but, but a big engineering project to build a framework that can host and train the models on-prem, online, and there are multiple configurations online. We call it, we call it now AI center and everything we do is hosted or trained uh, in AI center. It is a, it is a very big project. 
And all these models can be fine-tuned, so you have to have kind of separate instances. Not not all, not all, but many of them. Uh, we don't allow the computer vision model to be uh, trained by customers or the OCR. Mm-hmm. Although although for the OCR we have to get the feedback from the customers and improve. Uh, but in document understanding, most of our models are retrainable, and this is why. We have a model for receipts, a model for invoices, and uh, basically we have a one big model with multiple tasks. Mm-hmm. But then, but then, when customers start to use this uh, this uh, out of the box uh, model, either they want to fine tune or then on their data, which basically means overfitting on their data. Uh, but this is a good thing for them, uh, or they have a bit of a different schema, or they have a totally different schema. So for all those cases, they have to fine tune uh, our models. So I mean, 2018 isn't that long ago by the calendar, but I feel like in terms of ML frameworks, it's it's kind of ancient history. I mean, what when did you end up choosing for your your um, your ML framework? Like, what, what are these models training in, and and how do you actually deploy them? We uh, started with a mix of PyTorch and TensorFlow. Oh, a in, mix of PyTorch and TensorFlow? Wow. Well, did... <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't mix them on purpose. We, we preferred PyTorch from the very beginning. But our computer vision models, uh, uh, we, that, at that time, it was a lot easier to do this in TensorFlow. Mm-hmm. Google had a research repo uh, we implementing faster RCNN. It was exactly what we needed. Uh, we, 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 use, we, we took that model and trained with our own data. So we, had, we, we used both. In document understanding, we used PyTorch from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. And then later, it became easier with PyTorch. And actually, we also got a bit of a performance boost with PyTorch. I mean, uh, quality performance. So at this point, everything we do is in PyTorch. Uh, we train the models. Uh, and then we ship these models in AI Center. Mm-hmm. And for the customers, they only see AI Center. We kind of do auto ML. We don't expose that many hyperparameters. It's a very few things to expose. The other thing I want to mention that was very tricky is we have to, for people to train our models, they can uh, fine tune our models in two ways. One is if they label data, and this is what they do before they deploy, they, they label 100, 200, 500 documents, and we, we gave them our own tools to label, um, or they can fine tune uh, on the data. Uh, once we deploy, we have a human in the loop concept and the validation station, and someone does fix our mistakes for the workflow to continue. And from those mistakes, we close the loop and we do learning. So those are the two the two de- types of data used for learning. So to come back, when we do a release, we make a branch, we train our models. We basically ship containers with code and models, and then and then in a center uh, they are hosted and tra- and trainable also. And I guess back in 2018, there was definitely a sense that PyTorch is kind of the framework for research, where TensorFlow is kind of more for production deployment. Like, how did you think about that? Like, what was the key feature that made you prefer? PyTorch to TensorFlow and choose to standardize on it, even though there were some models in TensorFlow that felt like they solved your needs really well. It was how debuggable PyTorch is that it was really, we optimized for developing faster. I mean, TensorFlow is a good framework, but it is really hard to use. It's been always hard to use even after they did the TensorFlow to zero. We didn't have such a big issue with performance. Our computer vision model runs on GPU and we have it's it runs in a sub second so basically 0.5 0.6 seconds you cannot really see human can only see notice things that take more than 0.7 or 0.8 seconds so we didn't have a, a, an issue with cv but also when we moved from tensorflow for, to pytorch our pytorch inference was a bit faster we didn't exactly understand why mm-hmm. uh, but it was definitely not slower but in any case we didn't have a big performance thing and then the most of our document understanding models actually run on CPU. Mm-hmm. And the request the request takes uh, a second and a half, two seconds, something in this range. And for document processing by the robot, this is fine. So clearly, in, in some scenarios, TensorFlow was faster and PyTorch was too slow. But that didn't happen for us. We, we just didn't have a performance issue back then. 
do you do any kind of performance monitoring? Like, I guess you have this, you know, this human loop system to sort of catch issues of the models feeling uncertain, but are things like concept drift and data drift stuff that you actually kind of watch in, in production? We have to do a lot more here. Uh, drifting is a concept that we have to be concerned about. But for us, even before that, before the drifting, we have a hard time telling to a customer if the data is good enough or not for training. And then if we don't say anything and then we they start a very expensive labeling process and training process, and then we say, ah, your model didn't work because the data did it, but why didn't you say something before? We don't have a good visual way to tell people, you have to be labeled this much, you are now 50% done, 70% done, or label more of this, label more of that. Uh, this is an issue for us. And then, of course, the, 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 the drifting, uh, but we didn't solve the first problem. Do you do any kind of active learning in the labeling? Do, do you try to pick examples that are going to help the model the most? Or h- how do you think about that? We That's another thing that is kind of a debt we have to do more active learning. We train on, uh, we, do, we do mostly supervised learning. Uh, we now uh, know how to also do pre-training on unsupervised learning for document understanding and for a CV. Uh, active learning is something that we are now thinking about. It's not something that we shipped, uh, but clearly it is our way forward. Hmm. Where do you think this goes? Like, what are what are applications that you're really excited about building new models to do, and what would that help you? I bet do that it can't do now. We have a very interesting project uh, called Task Mining. Task Mining is a product that runs on people's desktops, uh, records they, uh, records what people do, and then has a nice, interesting algorithm to find what are the most common processes. If you ask a CIO what to automate, they have a hard time to say exactly what people are doing, especially in a larger world. Uh, so we built this task mining pro- product that instead of having analysts and a lot of people talking and figuring out what, what has to be automated, we try to discover this thing ourselves. It is a very interesting project. It has a lot of potential for us. Uh, basically, we start with pictures. Uh, uh, we have a recorder that knows when something relevant happens, like a click or a type. Uh, and we end up with a, two weeks of recording for, let's say, 10, 15 users. And then we have to find some processes. It's a very, very interesting interesting process, uh, product. And we have a lot less research from the big companies or from the universities. Nobody's really doing research on this. In CV, in DU, you can just uh, read a paper, you know what's going on. Not not, not so much here, so we have to do our own research. Uh, That's one project that we are very excited about. So the idea here is you could look at what people do over and over, what where you're confident they're going to click on something or type something. No, no, not that. That one, we think about that one too, like recording people and believe what's the most likely thing they're going to do, like a language model for actions. But Mm -hmm. task binding binding is actually different. Task binding, uh, we look at the recording after two weeks, let's say for 15 people, and then we find the processes. Ah, I see. We found that uh, the most, uh, the best process to automate is, for example, invoice processing. Or the best process to automate is some lookup that starts in some browser, does a lookup, goes to Excel, and um, uh, this kind of process. We just find the better candidates for automation. I this see. is just this is just a short summary. In, in reality, it's a little more complicated, and we don't exactly find the process. We build an explorer for the customer to find it, uh-huh. but still, we, we still we believe we take a process that takes like on average fifty days down to maybe two days or something like this. Have you tried uh, this on yourself? I'm, I'm, I'm imagining, I wonder what, what it would see me doing all day long. Uh, well, uh, us developers and engineers are not really good. <laughs> if, we, if, if we record us, we'll see probably a lot of random stuff and uh, <laughs> coding and uh, more watching and debugging. I, I, I cannot see myself recording something that brings any value to the product. 
I'd be just scared to, I mean, I'd be interested, maybe afraid to know how much time I spend sort of like moving around meetings or um, <laughs> sending emails. <laughs> we don't do like a big brother kind of thing that tells you what you do and how you waste your time. No, we, 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 we don't make people look, feel, feel bad about it. No, we, we just trying to find the real processes and not all the overhead and um, yeah, the distractions. <laughs> yeah. <I see. laughs> yeah. It does seem interesting though to to predict where somebody is going to click or or what they're going to type. I could imagine you can make interesting, you know, UI changes to help somebody if you can sort of know what they're likely to do next. This is for us uh, one of the things we want to look in the future. Uh, can we tell what people are going to do? And assuming we can, what do we do with that information? Let's suppose you click in three uh, edit boxes, and now we know we are going to click in the fourth. What do we do? We cannot take the mouse from you and start without telling you. So it's like the autopilot. You cannot. So we don't know the experience. We don't know what the, what the good experience is. Uh, but so far, we don't even know how to do that. The other thing we can do that's probably a bit easier is we can see when you create a workflow. Mm -hmm. And then we can tell you that we see you doing like a few clicks and a few types. And we recognize that this is actually an action that we know. So we have those simple activities when we create workflows, like click and type and those kind of things. But we can also have more complicated activities, like create a user in Salesforce. We can tell after we do three or four things, we can maybe tell that you are going to do 10 more and all those 15 steps in, in the end are just one activity, which is create user. This is the kind of thing I think is a bit closer to us. But yeah, the ultimate goal is to just have the computer do the human work without, with minimal intervention from the human, but I don't think we're that close. Interesting. Have advances in language models, like I feel like since 2018, languages models have gotten kind of much, much bigger and kind of better at predicting words. Has that affected you at all? Like, do you use these sort of like kind of modern, gigantic language models in your product? Uh, we use uh, the bird models. We use uh, we use those big models. We don't we don't do a GPT three kind of thing. Although we did some experiments with it, uh, we don't do zero shot learning just yet. Uh, so we don't have a we don't use a language model for this kind of predicting the next words uh, thing. But we do use the the large models trained with with mass language models. We use them in uh, unstructured documents uh, and we use them in semi-structured documents. There is a model uh, called Layout LM built by Microsoft uh, and that's a transformer in 2D. And that one is, is useful for us for the, for the semi-structured content. Cool. It's funny, going into this conversation, I was prepared to ask a lot of questions around the mix of traditional ML and, and deep learning, but you seem like very much more than I thought using primarily deep learning models. Is that accurate or do you do any kind of traditional machine learning as well? We try to use the best tool we know of for a task. We don't say it's not neural network uh, is out. Uh, we have all sorts of smaller things, all sorts of smaller classifiers that just use a bag of words and uh, trees and uh, those kinds of things. We have reasons for classification to use simpler models because they are more explainable or easy, easily explainable. Mm. We usually offer choice. In computer vision, we don't have, in OCR, we don't have a simpler model. We have to use the neural networks. But in document understanding and especially in classification, we have, uh, we have other, other methods as well. Interesting. Can you give me an example of how a model might give you more explainability and, and, and you would pick it? A lot of people talk about that, but it's hard to get real case studies. We had a customer who want to classify documents and they want to do two things. After the model is trained, they want to see which words or which features define each class. Uh, but then they also want at inference time to tell which words were the main contributors to a prediction. Hmm. It was a very interesting uh, conversation we had with the customer. We, before that, we were talking about explainability in more abstract terms, but this was a real use case. Uh, and, and at the predict time, they want to see those words who actually contribute to a prediction in the evaluation phase. But I'm pretty sure they also wanted 
uh, when the model is deployed. And not, not everybody will look at those words, but they want to have the option when the model is deployed to see uh, to see kind of the weights on those uh, on those words. And you you can do the same thing with the bot models, but it's more complicated. You have to get the tokens, and it it, it is definitely simpler. And 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 also the other uh, thing I want to say is that we are not going to train for a customer a bot model that takes uh, eight hours to train. Or fine tune when we can train a bag of force model in five seconds with similar or better performance. Where do you think the the kind of cutoff is? Like at what at what point would you would you switch from like a bag of words to like a more complicated model? I think this is really hard uh, to say. Uh, in some cases, you have to try both to know. We have some guidance maybe, but we cannot really tell. I think it depends. It depends more on the content. I think than the size. It is a mix of number of documents. Most of our customers have very few documents and they expect us to learn from a very, very, very small number of documents. For example, they believe if they give us two forms, if they have like two templates and they give us two forms for each, we should be able to do something. And that's that's a reasonable expectation. We have some more traditional models, no deep networks involved, um, that actually do just that. You give us a document, we look at it and we remember it. You have a second document that we believe is the same, and then we are go- we are able to match them. Uh, we call this uh, forms AI is our newest feature, mm-hmm. um, and this one doesn't use uh, neural networks; it's just uh, matching and searching and more traditional techniques. But but I think what we are going to do is when people have documents, they sh- we don't want to ask them to start with a thousand documents or even five hundred. That's too much. There are cases when the documents are very much the same. And then we should start document by document and use simple techniques internally. We should not even tell the customer what to do. But if the documents are kind of the same, or very actually the documents are very much the same, then we can deal with them without neural networks. But if they keep giving us documents and we keep making mistakes, after 5, 8, 10, 15 documents, there is a cutoff point where we'll say this template is just too complex for our simplest method. Our simplest method is more like a vehicle to get you started. Where we end depends on the content. Mm, interesting. That kind of reminds me, do, do you do um, any kind of auto ML? Like is, is hyperparameter search something that you do all the time or uh, on, in certain cases? How do you think about we that? We implicitly do auto ML. You cannot, at this point in 2022, you cannot tell a customer that we give you a classification, but you have to change the learning rate, you have to change the bed size. You cannot do that. You have to find a way to do auto, whether you like the word, the term or not, you still do some sort of auto ML internally. And the, we, there are models that are kind of easier to generalize and you don't have to change as many hyperparameters, and some of them are harder. But, but, the ideas that you had before, like if you remember the Azure ML products where you give like people 50 choices and 50, you, that's I think we are past that and people expect you just figure out what to do. But if you internally want to train one model or 50 and choose the best one, I think that's up to us. But it's interesting because it seems like from a lot of the examples you gave, sometimes your goal is not to make the most accurate model, but the model that will kind of fine tune the best on customer's data, does that mean that you're optimizing something special? How do you know if the model's good in that kind of situation? We have some evaluation framework. Uh, But you're right. Uh, We don't necessarily... Let me give you an example. If you train a model for too long, you might end up with a slightly better model, but the confidence scores are worse because the way that the, the overfit works and the way that the numbers get too close to one and basically you make very you are very confident for wrong predictions. You get most predictions right, but but the ones you get wrong, you are very confident. Uh, and this is a thing that we have to figure out. What is the trade-off between the overall model performance um, and other things? Um, uh, fine-tuning is an aspect. One thing that our customers really care a lot about is our confidence scores. Everybody will take us a, a, a model that's like three points worse in terms of quality if the confidence scores are perfect, because the confidence scores will tell us will tell them when to get a human involved. Mm-hmm. So yeah, 
it's not it's not only about getting the absolute better best model like a paper kind of uh, goal for us the goal is to kind of make the product work not necessarily just have the highest score for the model i really appreciate that perspective i guess switching gears a little bit but something i really wanted to cover is looking at your background it looks like you've kind of gone from more traditional software engineering to you know running a, a machine learning organization and i know from talking with you know people that enjoy um these interviews that's the perspective of a lot of people watching this um so i'm kind of curious if, if that's actually true if you um kind of learned machine learning mid-career and either way if you have any advice for someone that's trying to do the same type of thing i was at microsoft for a very long time uh doing software engineering uh, and then after like 12 13 14 years something like this i wanted to do something new and i didn't exactly know what to do and i was very lucky to talk to a few people at microsoft that actually made me see there is this machine learning uh, opportunity and then i started to learn and i was really fascinating to kind of go back into learning mode now that, now that I look back at the last 20 years, uh, I had a gap. I, I, I kind of thought you join Microsoft, you learn on the job. And this is true to some extent, but I don't think it's enough. So then I went back into more learning mode and um, did some math and some statistics that I have not done for the previous, I don't know how many years. Um, and then after about... 18 months or so of doing this for maybe four or five hours a day, nights and weekends and so on. Then I thought I was uh, ready to change jobs. And then I I uh, uh, moved from my previous engineering role to a Microsoft research team. And that was a very good move for me. I, I was just learning this thing. So they hired me to help them more to the engineering, but also they understood that I want to do more machine learning. Um, but then I thought actually I also want to go back to school and I started the master's uh, program in computer science at UW. So yeah, so basically what happened is that I spent like about four years or so learning online Coursera at the beginning and then, and then this master's and then I was able to transition from uh, from a software engineer role to, to this ML thing. Do you have any advice for your younger self or someone that wants to make this transition? I think they have to be motivated. And this is a long journey. I think if you believe you do this in two months, I think that's not setting the right expectations. You have to be prepared for a longer transition. And I think you have to go back and do some math. It depends uh, after how many years you want to transition. It's a lot easier to transition early. And, and, and also for, young, for younger people who now go to those uh, good universities, they have good knowledge about math that's fresh in their mind, and they have good uh, ML courses if they are interested. So I think what I can say is more for people who actually spend like 10, 15 years in software engineering, just prepare for a longer journey um, and, and and try to learn the fundamentals. If you rush into it and you, it's not enough to be able to say model.fit and put some parameters in there. That's not going to do it. Um, and I, I strongly recommend uh, those master's programs. I think they are, they are good programs and they, 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 they kind of force you to, to put more time and uh, you have to do a lot of projects and uh, homeworks. And I think the other thing I, uh, I thought was a good resource is to do Kaggle competitions. I was in three of them and it was just a great experience, but very, it, it the, the, the second part of it was very intense, but overall, uh, Kaggle is a great resource. I think. Mm, I love that answer. Do you, um, think that your background in software engineering makes you approach machine learning differently in any way? I don't know what to say about that one. I think it's good to have some software, some software engineering experience. So a few things happen. If you don't do software engineering for a few years, like I didn't do software engineering for five years now, you are not current anymore. Things happen. You don't exactly understand. I hear people talking and 
more and more it happens to me that I don't understand the details of what they're talking. I think it's very hard to to do ML and do engineering, basically both at, at a good level. Uh, this is why at UiPath we have a separation between a more science ML team and the engineering team. Uh, but I think it's good to have it's good to have the background. It's good to understand memory and processors and threads. Um, Are there differences in the way that you think teams should approach an ML problem versus an engineering problem? Like, is even the sort of like cadence of shipping different? The ML team has to take more chances. And you cannot have the ML team work on a schedule and have clear times for when something is done. Something might never be done. It's also okay to fail. If someone starts a project today at UiPath and there is no result, but they do the right thing and you you learn from that, that's a good project. Sometimes you have to spend some time to learn that something doesn't work. It's harder to do this in engineering. In engineering, you have more uh, strict schedules, more products and uh, all those huddles and sprints and so on. So yeah, I think we have to, you have to do to organize somehow different. We are a more hacker kind of uh, org than engineering. And we are, so, we are so more flexible, easier to move people from one project to another. Uh, for us now, our CV model, our DU model, our task mining model, they have a lot of things in common. It's funny, do you, we were talking to Jeremy Howard, you know, the, the fast AI founder, and he was saying that he thinks that engineering software is kind of more fun because you, you make like incremental progress that you can really see. And I was kind of reflecting on that. Like, I think my background is more in ML, but actually adding features to the weights and biases product is, is definitely more satisfying for me than training ML models. Cause I feel like ML models, all, mostly they don't work and the debugging cycles are way, um, longer and harder is that consistent with with your experience or there must be something yes. about ml that you love yes but i mean we do new features although we don't i mean it depends how you define engineering this is i think the way i look at it is this you have people who do research science and they write papers they create new knowledge we don't do much of that we have one researcher and we want to hire a second one but for the most part we don't do research we do apply science though. Most of our team is an applied science team. So we do build new features and it is, our work is I think maybe 10% in training the models and, and the rest is to just make something happen, uh, uh, make them work somehow, put them together. Uh, but then is the engineering team who actually puts those things in production and create the containers and and deploy in all data centers and uh, takes care of scale and uh, availability and all networking and all the other things. So that's why I'm saying it depends where we draw the line. Our we, we in this team don't just train models and then tell others, okay, take the models. And we do the post-processing. We in, in, in most cases there is more post-processing than the model itself. Um, we do pre-processing, we do data manipulation. So we build some feature. Uh, not just a model that doesn't do anything, it's just uh, nice and shiny. But I, I know what you're saying. We also like to build features. Are there different ways that your team collaborates together? Is it a different kind of collaboration than an engineering team? Even though I know you're applied science, it's still kind of a different thing than you know uh, software engineering, I think. So are there kind of different ways to do code reviews and things like that on, on your team? We have uh, less process than engineering teams I'm aware of. I don't know in detail how an engineering team functions now. Uh, but I think many things are in common. We want people to write good codes. Uh, we want people to write the simplest code possible and not complicate things to the point that nobody understands. So there are some things that are similar. But there are also some things that are different. When we merge a PR, we don't ask people questions. I mean, like, have you seen this one in production? What is the impact? Uh, what is the latency difference? Uh, we don't do, uh, where is the telemetry? Although we want to have telemetry. Um, I think the coding part is quite similar to engineering. 
But the way we change our mind and the way we choose the project and uh, and what to do and what to not do and and the flexibility, I think, is diff- is the main difference. Mm, interesting. And then the testing is also something that we are very. I mean, it, testing is very important. You cannot ship a good product if you don't have unit test, automated test, and so on. So, so some of those end-to-end testing are owned by engineering, but we also do significant testing. That's an, so that's another thing that's similar between us and engineering. I think I think is 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 really the flexibility that's different. If we now believe a project is really important, we can easier uh, move people around. Uh, we now have a semantic automation project that tries to make the robots understand better what's going on, not just click and type. And this is a mix of CV and document understanding, and we can apply the same knowledge. We can use the same graphs. Uh, yeah, there are many, many, many things that are similar uh, between um, our team and engineering. Interesting. Well, um, we always end with two questions, and I want to make sure that we we give you some time to answer them. So, what's a, an underrated aspect of machine learning or deep learning that you think people should pay more attention to, or maybe what's something that if you could go back to school or had more time to look into, you would spend some time engaging with? I think there are two ways to answer the question. Uh, I think people uh, spend a lot of time on models. And I think people should spend more time on data. And this is changing in the last year or so. You have uh, you, you see this more and more. Uh, if you want to improve the product, uh, look at the data more than look at the models. Um, so that's something that people are talking about. I, I, to me, I would also like to see uh, more effort into more business kind of data. Uh, all those nice models are trained on Wikipedia, and uh, but in, customers have very small data sets with all those semi-structured things. There are no paragraphs, no sentences. Uh, it's quite hard to take a good BERT model uh, or all those NLP models and apply them on the documents that you see in, in the enterprise. Uh, there is a lot of a lot less context. Uh, the the graphs are less uh, uh, connected and so. Uh, so this is this is about data sets and about customer data and business data. I totally agree with actually all the points that you just made. But I guess I want to ask about the data thing. You know, people have been noticing that it's a better use of time to spend more time with data for, you know, twenty years at least, as long as I've been kind of watching it and yet it seems so hard to get um teams to look at it as much as they should by team's own admission i mean what do you think is going on there like why is it so hard to orient more towards the data than the the models it's not clear who is motivated by that job i mean people have been talking about it in theory not really do, do anything about it and if you look at what people really love to train models even before the neural networks people love to train the uh, trees and so on. But not many people are passionate about the data in itself. All our good people do the data manipulation and the cleanup of the data just to build better models. Uh, There are now companies who help with the data, including what you guys do. But what is the profile of a person for us to hire to actually really focus on the data is unclear. Do you want to have software engineers, you have data engineers, is, is, is unclear. I think I think this job really belongs to the applied scientists, but they rather do something else with their time. So this I think this is why uh, everybody says we should do more progress, but actually nobody really does. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> OK, that makes sense. <laughs> my, my final question for you, and, and, and and this is an interesting one because you've put probably more models into production than than most people in the world, most people on this show. Um, what's the hardest part about getting a model from you know kind of conception to running live in production? When we build something, we start the ML part, so we see if a project has legs. But then to ship it, you need a big machinery in place. You need 
testing and you need engineering and you need product and you need alignment and people to sell to customers, the real thing, not oversell or undersell. So I think building whole, this whole machinery is, the, is to me the biggest part. In the end, when you are done, uh, you realize that the ML part that we love so much is just a small thing. Whether it's 10% or 15, I'm not sure, but is, there is a lot more work uh, on top of that. People in ML should give more credit to engineering and product managers and pre-sales uh, because without those people, there is no really ML in production. Yeah, so having and then having everybody aligned and, and, and kind of see the same, uh, go in the same direction, this is, uh, this is tricky. Uh, the other thing that's tricky is to have more experimentation in the product. We struggle with convincing our product managers and our engineering to do more experiments, put more stuff into their code so we can experiment and maybe ship a better product. It is very hard to, to take time off their schedule for something that's have that has the potential to give you nothing. On the other hand, if you don't do this and you are only ex if you only exploit and don't explore, that's not good. So this is another tricky thing. How you convince the whole org to have the right mix between exploring and exploiting. Awesome. Well, that's a great answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. This Thank you. Fun. I very, appreciate it. very nice. Very nice talking to you, Lucas. If you're enjoying these interviews and you want to learn more, please click on the link to the show notes in the description where you can find links to all the papers that are mentioned, supplemental material, and a transcription that we work really hard to produce. So check it out. <laughs>